Thank you. Hello, everybody. Hello, and hello, everybody on live stream as well. And thank you so much, Tog, for having me here today to talk to you all about doing things differently with diversity. But, so actually, I'm going to take you on a journey today, if that's okay. But before I take you on that journey, I want to talk to you and tell you about a love story. It's a love story that occurred in the face of fear. Fear was overcome and love was chosen instead so that we could help serve people and help them overcome their own fears. And basically, it was a struggle for me from the very beginning. I was born with a father who didn't really appreciate women, to be honest. I went to a school that was a mix, non, it was a selective school, so it was quite academic, and I was in every single bottom set. And it nearly destroyed me. Because I was labeled as stupid, because I was dyslexic, and naughty, because I couldn't sit still. And then when I started growing up, I had these bouts of real shyness. And it made it really awkward in certain social situations. And then when I was growing up even still, I started to question my sexual orientation. And that's when the anxiety came. These floods of anxiety that would overcome me. And then I went into working world. And in that working world, I started to obviously gravitate towards these, what we call ERGs, these employee resource groups that were kind of facets of my life. So empowering women, diversity and, and, uh, um, and DE&I is what we call it, diversity, equity and inclusion, we're going to come to later. And also, of course, LGBT. But with all of this opportunity that I was getting involved with, there were, there were these opportunities to speak as well. And as you can imagine, all of these different things, dyslexia and anxiety, all of these really made it quite difficult for me to speak. So I'd got to this point where I was like, this is either going to consume me or I've got to own this. So I just decided to throw my all at it. Blood, sweat, and tears, that's what they say. I don't think there was much blood, thankfully. But there was definitely lots of tears, definitely lots of sweat, definitely lots of money as well, actually, and lots of time thrown into it. And I'm grateful, because what I learned along the way, I then learned I am here to help teach others. I'm here to see people go through those same struggles with speaking, those same struggles with dyslexia and all the things I had growing up. And I'm here to help people tell their stories. Because when we tell our stories, we have the opportunity then to change people's lives, to help them choose love over fear. And that's a bit about what we're going to be talking about today. So in terms of DE&I, how can we lean into that love space? So I should really introduce myself. My name's Kate Monday, as you well heard. And oh God, I don't know what to call myself these days. I was calling myself a speaking coach. And then people started coming to me and saying, oh, I know somebody with a speech impediment. It's not quite what I was going for. But <laughs> what I do do is help people tell stories. So I've worked for Google for the last eight years, helping brands tell their stories. And then more recently, I set up out-the-box speakers. And... This also is about coaching and educating and helping people tell their stories. And my friend asked me, why out-the-box speakers? And I think that's a good, great question. And it's really about helping people step out of their box, these boxes that society can find us to, and step into this circle, this safe circle that makes them feel uh, like they can speak their truth. And really, when I was setting up, it's like a classic lockdown. I don't want to just talk about helping people anymore. I actually want to do it. Classic lockdown startup. And, uh, and I really started to think about, you know, what is the culture that I want to define in this company? And there were four key pillars for me and something that I really try and instill in every bit of coaching and every bit of speaking that I do. And that's really one, it's empathy. It's listening to our audience. In every single time we speak, we need to think about who our audience, what are they like, how can we really connect and resonate with them. 
It's then about authenticity. How do we tell authentic stories? And how do, we, how do I create a psychologically safe environment so that people feel like they can be vulnerable? Because when we speak, it's super vulnerable, right? We're going through some, some pretty deep topics. The third is about feedback. So I always offer 360 feedback. We do lots of filming of uh, when we're coaching so that people can watch themselves back and see what they're like. I give feedback and we try and get as much feedback as possible from others. And last but not least, it's about action. Taking action is the hardest thing. Once you've done it once, it's really easy to do it. Um, but like I said, stop saying things and actually uh, doing things is, is what it's all about. And what's funny is actually said working for Google and getting involved uh, more recently in a creative part of the business, I found that a lot of my own, these four pillars, correlate with some things we talk about um, with the creative aspect of Google as well. So we work with lots of partners to create really good YouTube ads. And when doing this, Google has created this uh, toolkit, I don't know if you can see it at the bottom there, it's called All In, and it's all about, are you all in? Are you throwing everything about into being all inclusive? And they too believe that there are these four key things that you can do. First, it's about creating from an inclusive lens. Secondly, it's about telling authentic stories, very similar. Third, it's about, can you enhance your work post-production? And fourth, it's all about making it accessible to everyone. So I'm going to be alluding to the advertising industry throughout. You'll see how I'll bring in some YouTube ads as well and, and show you what people have been up to because it's actually really telling of what society is doing because brands are constantly looking at behaviors that humans are showing and actually trying to pull that into their advertisements and make sure they're being really relevant and of the times as well. So you'll see that um, a bit throughout. But really, these are the things we're going to go through today. So D and I, what is it? How do we start doing things differently? Talking about empathy, of course, then authenticity, then feedback, and then, of course, action. Does that sound good? Sound okay? We're going to leave some time as well for a bit of Q&A. So if you do have any questions, make sure you save them until the end. And I guess who here thinks that diversity is important? Good, okay, so we are in the right room. Okay, great. <laughs> we do think it's important. Great. Could you imagine if you'd said no after I'd done all that spiel? Nightmare. <laughs> Thank goodness. So we'll crack on then and we'll start off with DEI. What is it? Why is it important? What are we doing? And how can we be doing things differently? So, did you know there are lots of barriers to being authentic? And here are some. So actually only 1% still of Fortune 500 companies have a black CEO. Bi uh, yeah, bisexuals are three times less likely to come out than lesbians. And lesbians are three times less likely than gay men to come out as well. 73% of women experience microaggression in the workplace. And actually 33% of that is said to be sexual explicit comments. One only, one in five of working aged people are classified as, um, so only, no, actually, lots of one in five people um, who are of the working age are classified as having a disability. And 61%, so that's over half of us all, felt the pressure to hide our identity in some way. At the work in the workplace so just shows you there is actually a lot of barriers a lot of people still feeling like they can't authentically be themselves actually raise your hand who here thinks feels like they can be completely authentically themselves at the workplace okay great well, I think that's a lot more than we would have had a few years ago which is great to see and great to hear but still some people will not with their hands up which is the, you know, obviously the room, the effort that we've still got um, to do. And I think this is a good example of the progression we've made.
recently saw this. It was across everything, all social medias. And it is, right, it's good. We're showing that we've made progress. Now we have a black um, little mermaid, which is uh, Ariel, isn't it? It's a mermaid, go, I got that right. Um, which is great, just does show progress. But that's just, when you watch a movie, that's just, you're gonna watch it one or two times, right? But advertising, you see maybe 40 times sometimes. And that's why we're gonna be talking a lot more about advertising as well, because it really is important. And what we see in ads actually really reflects, like I said, society and has a real big impression on society as well. And it's not just become a moral thing. Before it was in advertising, it was the, the morally right thing to do to actually show diversity in our ads. But now actually, it's really profitable as well. We found that some of the most diverse ads actually lead to the most lucrative uh, businesses. 2.6 times more likely to purchase from a brand that is showing that they are culturally relevant in their ads. And it kind of makes sense, right? Because if you see somebody who looks and feels like you in an ad, you might have seen the product before and thought, oh, that's great. But now you see somebody wearing the product or using the product that looks like you, then you become it's much more relatable, relevant, and then you're much more likely to buy it. And this is an example from the NFL final in 2021. They were actually using this Asian American woman in casting. Um, and it just shows, again, like I said, we've got a long, uh, we've come a long way, but actually we're missing out on so much here. You see lots of ads, I think like about 75% of ads or something like this now are actually talking about considering when they're at casting stage, using a diverse range of, um, of talent, but actually what we're missing out on here is the other aspects. What about disabilities? In fact, only 1% of ads show people with disabilities. Um, and actually when we look at qualifying disabilities, a lot of them aren't acknowledged or they don't know where to put them. So they put them in kind of like the miscellaneous, but fuck it. Um, which is such a shame, because again, we're not being truly representative. We're actually, what about sexual orientation? What about gender identity? You know, there's all these other parts of diversity that we're missing out on here. It's not just about ethnicity uh, and, and showing people of different race. So what exactly is DE&I? Of course, it's got three letters there. I think this is a great one to, uh, to I guess, depict it. So diversity is being invited to the party, but inclusion is being asked to dance. I love that. And like I said, this is another brand that is doing a great job in actually showing that diversity. Um, but Heidi Zack, who is the CEO uh, of uh, Third Love, she actually talks about that she's creating a few, she, she wants to create this brand for the future that doesn't just look at skin tone, that actually goes beyond that and looks at different shapes and sizes of women, different ages, different ethnicities and genders, and all of these things. And she said that, look, this isn't groundbreaking, and actually this should just be the norm. And I literally couldn't agree more with what she's saying here. But it just shows you here, we're talking about increasing your value. When we, they did do this campaign, they actually increase their sales year and year by nearly 350%. So it shows that actually it's important for brands to be doing. And this is really, though, why it's important for brands to be doing it. Go that? Yes. <laughs> there you go. So it just shows hey, you. Thanks for watching. You just shows you what we can do, the impact we can have when we're representing people in the right way. We can literally like change their lives. So I want you to tell me.
how diverse and inclusive is your workplace? We saw that you feel like you can be at home half the room, but show me. So one being pretty poor and five being really good. How diverse do you think your workplace is? Show me with your hands. One being poor, five being good. Okay, mixed bag. Oh, we've got a two, three, two, three, five, five. Ooh, squeaking at the back. <laughs> okay, mixed bag. They're right. Okay, that's diverse. What about inclusive? How included? So again, one off, one to five. Okay, we got a solid one down here. <laughs> okay, and five, five. Okay, great. Okay, mixed again, mixed bag. We got some work to do though, right? I think it does show us. We we definitely do have some work to do. And what does success look like? What do we think? Call out if you can. I'll repeat what you say. What does success look like? What are we aiming for here? Fives, yeah, good, good point. How could we be really diverse and inclusive? Very quiet. Difficult question. It is difficult because it is, I guess, also subjective, right? Um, really subjective. I was doing a, a talk yesterday, and these are some of the things that actually came up that I thought was quite interesting. A sense of belonging, feeling like you belong, feeling like you're included. Um, having an organizational commitment as well, really important that you're not just driving it from the masses. It's actually, you've got it cascading through the business or from a, from a, uh, a point of senior, seniority as well. Accountability in the same sense. Community, bringing people together, um, feeling safe and included and removing barriers as well. I think these are all really good shout. But like you said, it is. It is subjective. And that's what leads to this ambiguity as well. And this also, why we've got such a mixed bag <laughs> of two, three, fives and all sorts, because it really is up to the individual and also the organization to make this happen. So I'm going to ask you to do something. If you guys don't have a pen and paper to hand, you do have a mobile phone, I would love you to get it out right now. People are on live stream as well, pen and paper, a phone, whatever you have. And I'd love you to come up with, we only take a couple of minutes for this, but come up with some ideas. So there was some room for improvements. What are those rooms for improvement? First of all, and then have a little think about, you know, of those areas of improvement, is there one that could, that takes your uh, interest? And then note down what that success in that area could look like. So just three small tasks there, just for a couple of minutes. So you should dive down now some form of idea of an area of organization that you think could be improved. Hopefully, that's also aligns with your area of interest or you picked one that is in, in, in the same area. And then noting down like, what could that success actually look like? And as I said, we're gonna take you on a journey here. At the end of it, I want you guys walking away with something that is really tangible, where you feel like you can actually take some action on. Uh, so, where are we at? We've had a look at diversity and inclusion. Now let's talk about empathy. So how do we create from an, an inclusive lens? So the E, which one is it? Is it equality or is it equity? Do you know? If it, you think it's equality, raise your left hand. If you think it's equity, raise your right hand. Actually, both, to be honest. <laughs> but, well, it used to be a lot. Of, there you go. It used to be a lot about um, equality. That's what we used to talk a lot about. But we actually decided that that probably wasn't um, good enough, and we wanted to take that a step further. And that's where we came up with equity. And this is really the difference: is equality would be giving everybody the exact same height stool so that they could look over the fence at the crowd, whereas equity is about giving you the right size stool so that you can look over the crowd. Um, and it means that, and I think we can relate to this, right? Everybody's situation, especially with lockdown now, 
don't know about you, who lockdown changed people's lives, changed mine, yeah, everybody. <laughs> changed everyone, getting lots of nods as well. Changed everybody's life. And we've all now got very different situations. Very different situations. We might need, therefore, different things in the workplace. We might need to work from home some days where some other people don't need to work from home, etc. So therefore, that's why equity is really important for us to be considering. And it's also really important to be considering in the creative process. So going back and thinking about what we do at, uh, at Google is looking at this creative process, lots of people think about diversity and inclusion and how they can do things from an inclusive, diverse lens. But here, at the end, how can we, we've shot, we've shot a lovely video to then become an advertisement. How can we nip and tweak it and refine it to fit through this certain hole that we need to do? Just more of a tick box exercise. We've getting a little bit better though. So some people have started to think about the cast thing. Right, okay, we want to be inclusive and diverse. How do we actually create a diverse cast? And now they're obviously making sure that they have a wide range, I've already talked about this before, a wide range of different ethnicities, for example. Some of them are getting even better, and they've started thinking about this actually at the conceptual stages of how do they integrate this. However, we believe that none of this is actually good enough, and we need to be starting it right at the start. That's where we need to be starting to think about how, you know, who are we creating? Are we co-creating things? Who are we creating this with? Have we got the right people on our team? Are we giving people a chair at our table to make these decisions who are diverse themselves. Because ultimately that's gonna trickle through the rest of the company or the rest of the advertisement and, uh, and make sure that it's, it's diverse from, to, from uh, start to finish. And that includes all sorts of things, right? The use of language, for example, in creative is really important because that completely changes depending on who our audience are and who we're speaking to. Um, and it's really about making sure that we are being accessible as well. When we think about the hiring process at the start, are we actually, have we got the right hiring process in place to make sure that everybody is able to apply for the role? You know, are they going to be global? Are they, have they got disabilities? All of these things. There's lots of things we need. We always need to be overthinking these days so that we, um, we make sure we're adhering um, to this right at the start and, and having this inclusive lens. And I think a really good way of describing why this is important <clears throat> and how it can be effective is actually this. So this is IKEA and, um, and it won an award uh, in 2019 at the Cannes Awards. And, um, and basically one of their leaders had cerebral palsy. And he because he has cerebral palsy, was obviously testing and trialing out all of their products and <clears throat> found that they were completely inad inadequate for his needs. He wasn't actually able to open any of the drawers or the cupboards or use any of, the, uh, of any of their products. So what he did was created this whole new range of basically fit fittings and fixtures that would latch onto a wardrobe door or a cupboard, so then he could pull it open and it was suitable for his needs. So they, he actually opened up a whole other category of products and also allowed the, their products to be used for, for a lot of disabled people. So it was actually pretty incredible, but the whole reason that was able to happen is because they hired him on the board and, as I said, brought a chair to the table for him to actually help make those decisions. We can't play this video, can we? No, I don't think so. Anyway, I can follow up with you guys with it if you want to see it. It's very cool to see what actually went on. But this is what we think about. So it's something that we talk about a lot, especially in this diet, this, this uh, hybrid world that we're working in now. We need to be thinking, like I said, thinking more so than ever, communicating more so than ever. And we talk about consciously including so you don't unconsciously exclude. So it's really easy, especially if you think about this kind of hybrid world we're working in. Really easy. If somebody's on VC and you're presenting, for example, to a room of people, really easy to forget that they're there. So we need to 
really think about like how do we make sure that they're included we've got people on live stream how do we make sure that you feel included that you feel like you're almost in the room with us and and not being excluded so how do we create from an inclusive lens we've got another little exercise for you guys so a couple of minutes here if you could just jot down them what are the types of groups that you could form Think about this idea that you had at the start, this project, this area of the company that needs improving. What's required? How can we start to bring the people that we need together? Um, how could you get people involved as well? Maybe there are other people who think that this is a problem. Maybe there are other people who also share the same passion as you. Does that mean that you need to go and send some emails out? Does that mean you need to go and talk to the CEO? What do you need to do in order to put this on people's agenda? And then, of course, like I said, sponsorship from somebody of seniority is always really helpful. Yes, we can do things bottoms up, but top down also is a really key in obviously getting things moving. So let's have a little think about people. How do we create from that inclusive lens and jot down these three things? Okay, thank you guys for sharing. Love it. So we've got some ideas. So on to then authenticity. You just like this was meant to happen, wasn't it? After your uh, your bit there. So how do we tell authentic stories? And being vulnerable is obviously a massive part of that, and creating that psychological safety. Who here has joined a video call and seen this? Familiar? Yeah, seen some nodded faces. This is not vulnerable. <laughs> this is how you turn off your screen and you become a screen, right? you become unrelatable and it's not really helpful. And I think this is why now more than ever, we need to do the work of helping people turn on their cameras, show that they are a human, that they have different facets of their life, that they are um, yeah, able to be vulnerable and able to show themselves. And this is why in every meeting that I do now, I build in at least a five, 10 minute of chit chat at the start, just getting to know people and, and kind of lots of self-deprecation normally to like <laughs> break the ice um, and getting people to turn on their screens because then it's much harder also working remotely or hybrid as well for people to be vulnerable and authentic. But the more you do, you turn on, you show yourself, the more that people uh, can relate to you. And then obviously an advertisement, right? The more relatable we can be in advertisement, again, the more effective we can be as well. And I think a really good example of this is done by John Lewis. I've got a minute, just a little minute. I have only got a minute, just a minute. I have only got a minute. That is all the time I have to sing a tiny little minute waltz and hope that I can sing with no thoughts. And though it's difficult, I'll give it every last breath that I've got within my body. Hope that my performance won't be very shoddy to accept the thing that's not been done and just for fun to sing the minute waltz. I didn't do it! Yes, you did! As I sing the seconds fly on to sing the minute waltz by and now I am Less than 30 seconds, I have less than half a minute to complete this little minute walk. Run every note that's in the score. Walk. The sounds of time I know are pouring. Let me win my bet and I'll run with the money down to some big store and there I'll buy a honey. Only I can last the scale, I won't have failed to sing the little minute walk. Right, you can see just taking a look at that John Lewis advert that actually very relatable. We're talking about real life situations that we're all experiencing during lockdown and very cleverly then positioning their products and how they're actually providing solutions to a lot of the problems. Um, and, and actually, if you saw as well, the casting, pretty diverse, broad range of people as well. So again, whoever you are, you'll be able to relate to that in some way throughout and another really good one then in 2021 was this London arm. Ditch the saggy butts. Sweaty work shirt pits. Farewell to holy crotches showing your bits. Out with the dress down days. Every day. You're better than loose elastic and toothpaste dainties. Stop working out in Christmas PJs because they're the only stretchy thing clean. That outfit 
More disaster than Vrikshasana. And your neighbors are sick of your power snatch. In 2020, some of us got a bit too comfortable. But comfort doesn't have to be. Comfort can be sleek, sculpting, flattering and fierce. So whether we work from home, live at work or are home working out, in 2021, we'll look the business to do business and work it when we work out. We'll wear less bullshit and we'll wear it better. Get dressed for 2021. LNDR, no bullshit. Again, pretty relatable for the set. When it was launched again, we were obviously coming that weird stage and like lockdown, not lockdown, in and out of those waves, right? Where people were wearing bottom half gym kit, top half clothes for work. So very good timing, very relatable, obviously saying bullshit and things like this. So again, um, and a diverse casting range as well. So telling authentic stories is what it's all about. And relating to this, it's the exact same thing we need to do. It's exactly what you were just talking about. We need to lead by example, by us being authentic and telling our stories, telling our situations in lockdown and how we might need you know, certain things that are different from others, certain allowances, a bit more flexibility, whatever that is, is the only way in which we are gonna actually be able to create change. I had a really good story actually yesterday to this panel that I was on and this girl was talking about how she's created, she's got panic disorder um, through lockdown and she just got to this point where she couldn't actually even pick up the phone to tell her boss that she was struggling. She'd really worked herself up into this kind of situation and she just ma had to muster the strength to break through this and f say, look, I've just got to be vulnerable. I've just got to be vulnerable and admit that this is a big problem that I've been struggling with behind closed doors for this long. And off the back of it, she had a mate, people were sending her messages like, well done. Thank you so much for being so open and honest. Like I've been struggling too. Like she was just overwhelmed with the support and the love that she was shown. By doing that, actually it helped loads of other people come out about their circumstances, that they were also really struggling and, and, and finding challenges in different ways. So, so I said, we need to be vulnerable. We need to be talking now probably more than ever um, and telling our authentic stories. So in that light then, I'd like you to do a bit of a speaking uh, exercise. So people in the room, if you turn to the person next to you, I think we've actually got perfectly even numbers, which is excellent. Um, given the topic that you've chosen as well, um, I'd love you to tell a bit of an authentic story. Just one minute, doesn't have to be long, um, but a story about you, maybe it is something to do with lockdown, or maybe it is just in general to do with, obviously we've been talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then people on the live stream as well, um, maybe you could share it with somebody if there is next to you, or if not, write it down and, uh, and share it later on. Um, or you could talk it out loud to yourself or record yourself is always something that I recommend because then you can look back and uh, give yourself some feedback. So I'm going to take a couple of minutes here, just literally one minute and then change. If you are the listener as well, obviously make sure that you're actively listening to this person because they're being vulnerable, right? So we need to create that psychological safety, that environment where they feel like they can open up about these things. So leaning in, using your body language, nodding along always helps, mirroring them with their body language. And perhaps you need to ask them some other questions to clarify as well. And that's okay. That shows that you're, you're listening. So couple of minutes here, tell your story and then switch and share the other person's story. Off you go. Yeah, I just want to make sure that everybody's clear and happy what they want to do to their life. Well, I just had a question. These stories are all about your being authentically yourself. So maybe that is something from lockdown that you can talk about, a story that you can share that would help paint the picture of you, who you are. Um, maybe it's something from your childhood that I shared like at the start or whatever it is, any type of story where you feel like it's going to help paint the picture of you, really. This is what we are looking at now, authentic stories. So how do we lean into 
yourself, your story, be as authentic as you can. Hopefully that makes sense. Did so? You, did you learn something new about the other person? You ever going? Yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. Great. Were they vulnerable? Yeah. Did they open up to you about good. Great. Good. It's hard being vulnerable sometimes. Really difficult. So well done, guys. I really appreciate you being vulnerable like that. And did it help you get a feel for that person? Paint a picture of some of the things they might be potentially dealing with or struggling with, or or some challenges they might have. Yeah. Amazing, amazing. And this is it, right? We wouldn't know. If, if you hadn't told those stories, you wouldn't know. That's the truth of it. You wouldn't know, you wouldn't have a clue. So can you imagine being a manager to that person and imagine they were one of those people who just turned off their screen, kept themselves on mute, and you just don't know. This person's dealing with all this stuff, but you have no idea. And that is why... It's really important that we share, but not only for ourselves, but for other people. Because when we do share, people can relate. And that's how we create that success metric, that community, that sense of belonging. Sometimes you go, God, I didn't know that about you. I'm the same thing. You said that earlier to me. You were like, oh, your dyslexia and your disability, that's like the same. You, you kind of re resonated with, related to that. Um, exactly. Oh, oh your daughters, yeah. So exactly. And without me telling that story, you wouldn't go, God, there's other people also struggling. And we all would think that we're alone. So really important that we are authentic and, and telling and sharing our stories. So feedback. Feedback is a gift, is what we say at Google. And I do truly believe that. It's the only way that we're going to learn and grow. So if we think about what we've been doing and how we've been kind of bumbling along, we've got this thing, this part of our organization where we feel like we could actually make a difference We've actually started to think about how we could bring people on that journey with us. We can create an inclusive lens by bringing the right people to the table and getting them involved. We're then thinking about the stories that we might want to tell as well, maybe to these people or to the rest of the organization you might want to tell them to. But now, say that we've got this idea, how do we make it really relevant and fine tune it to our audience? Let's go back to advertising. So this is Adidas. They wanted to make ads that were really specific and relevant to their audience. So what they did is they had a long reel of shots, lots of different famous people. You might notice some of these names down here. And then they wanted to start targeting certain specific sets of audiences. So you can see this one here they knew they were going out to the US and it was going out to people who were interested in football. So if we click on this one, we'll see what they did. Make some noise! Yeah! The world needs an ass! Yes, buddy. Okay, come on. Mate, free. It's okay, come on. And that's it. This one, they knew they were going out to Japan and they were targeting tennis. What's up, Dojo? We need it, the world needs an answer. All right, come on, let's go. Okay, all right, mate, for you. It's your time, come on. So the point here is they had a very similar look and feel to the ads, but difference. There were differences in the sense that they knew that obviously they're going out to football fans, so they were putting players like Zidane, Stormzy, all the characters that they thought were going to be more relatable to that audience at the forefront. And also you can see as well, the actual the casting was more Americanized, whereas Japan, obviously there were more Asian casting and they had more relevancy to tennis players at the start of the advertisement for this subset and it just shows with us as well for example that I tell when I speak relatively I've got kind of like the same four or five stories that I tell but depending on the audience that I speak to if I'm getting up and doing a diversity talk I'll talk about my dyslexia and my you know this this aspect if I go and talk to an LGBT audience I'll really lean into like you know my coming out story and the difficulties around that and and when I was you know, and it just shows you actually you can home into different aspects 
of your authentic stories even in your organization depending on the audience but what it is all really about is fine tuning for your audience really understanding who you're talking to in the in your organization so maybe that is the ceo maybe that is the wider audience lots of colleagues and employees and thinking about what's really going to land that message for them but then once we obviously start talking and once we start doing these projects and cascading these messages through the business, it's really important that we test and learn. This is something, of course, Google being a big data company, we're really hot on. But there are also other companies as well that do a really great job in this. So Diversio is a, is a good example of this. They actually help organizations collect that data. So they help them send out surveys asking the right questions and then off the back of having those answers as well, how do they actually digest that information and then get organizations to act upon that information as well? It's really important that we act. If we go and ask people those questions like, how are we doing in diversity? And then people come back with feedback and we don't do anything about it, people will stop answering our questions. They'll get sick and bored and tired of it. So we more need to make sure that we actually integrate that back into our organizations. So this is what I want you guys to have a little think about now is testing and learning. So in terms of what your ideas that you've kind of come up with now, that you guys, for example, at the back, you want to create this community, this, this role, right? This person who's going to go out and actually start doing events specifically. How can we fine tune that? So let's think about our audience. What actually could they be doing? Um, and I want you to have a little think and share your ideas and give feedback so the person who's listening make sure you're listening and make sure you're like actually probing them or giving some suggestions or giving some feedback on where you think it could be better or could be uh, improved and then obviously switch so you both get that and people on live stream of course um i'd like you to think about if this was you what channels you could use maybe that is going out to social media maybe that is sending out emails maybe that is doing a questionnaire or, or a survey and thinking about the questions that you could ask so whether that is going to be a poll on social media or your slack channel or whether that is going to be um an email think about the different things that you could ask to get feedback around this so hopefully that's clear. What we're doing is, you know your ideas now because you've already spoken to each other, but now we're gonna fine tune it and get some feedback. So probing questions at each other to try and fine tune that idea so that it's gonna be really effective. That makes sense? Any questions? Oh, off you go. A couple of minutes, we'll be back. Um, great. I'm gonna bring it back in so we can start having a little wrap up last section so do we also do we do we fine tune it a bit do we find yeah a little bit okay get in there got an idea so we some of them go some of us are still working on ideas which is fine it's a work in progress so no worries we'll then go to the last stage then, which is all about action how do we take action how do we actually put things into play and I was going to do this with you, but I feel like it might take a little bit longer than we actually have. But good to, um, we're just going to ask ourselves the, these questions. But I do definitely recommend going and doing this. So BBC, well done BBC, have actually come up with this ally track, which is a really great way. What it actually does is asks you a series of questions and gets you starting to think about what privileges you have and how privileged, how privileged you might be in comparison to some others. So take a note of this down because it's, um, it's really good. It starts then, after you've defined the privileges that you have, starts to get you thinking about how you can be an ally and an effective ally and what are the different channels that you could actually use as well. So maybe that's just like standing up in meetings more and voicing or sharing your stories more, or maybe that is just um, being a passive ally as well, or be, being a, a, maybe a bit more of a subtle one, um, as and where needed. So it's a really great app. I definitely, or it's actually a website, definitely recommend having a little look at that. Um, so we're going to skip this. But this is what I want you to think about. These circles here of influence. So you've got your circle of control, which is I, me, and what I do. So this is all the things that I 
uh, can affect. So the things that I read, the people I speak to, the things I watch on TV, uh, all of these different aspects affect that circle and control. They affect who I am and what I do. And then you've got your circle of influence. This is us, we. Uh, and this is obviously us being able to influence the people that we're around as well. So they're the two different circles of influence. Circle of concern are things that you can't influence, unfortunately. They are things like um, the weather or politics or wars, all these things that actually are going on anyway that we just have to get on with, I guess, um, and not worry about too much. But thinking about these two things, we can influence. So that's really important. And I guess we need to start thinking about, like, what privileges do we have? So I totally recognize that. Although, yes, it was a bit of a convoluted upbringing. I was very privileged in lots of ways. You know, I wasn't brought up on the streets, for example. That is definitely, there's a big disparity there. I had a leg up in that sense. I did go to a really good academic school. So it did give me, again, a leg up in that sense. I do go to uh, work at an at a amazing company and have my own company, right? There's lots of different aspects there. And one of the best talks that I ever to uh, heard about allyship was actually Ruth Hunt, and she was the CEO of Stonewall, and she got up and talked about allyship and how actually leaning into your powers, she was a CEO, right? So she was bringing people into her boardroom all the time. They were pitching their ideas to her, and she had a choice. She could either just be disengaged and dismiss them, or she could lean in and really listen to them and give them a platform for them to feel valued. And the same sense, she talked about being at a party where she felt like she was really feeling really insecure. And somebody there, they had a choice to either ignore her and she would go on feeling insecure or go, Joe, you look lovely and make her feel valued and worthy and like she should, she belonged at that party. So all of the, we have got power every day and multiple different situations. Literally the power of your words, it's surprising how many people don't realize that you can make or break someone's day. So just have a little think about the powers that you have. Where do you have those privileged moments uh, that you can lean into? So what opportunities do you have at uh, a work, and then where can you be an ally and really make a difference? And they're obviously the different forms of action that we can take. So again, jotting this down, we're gonna take a couple of uh, minutes. Think about, or just actually one minute, we're gonna do this really quickly. Think about the opportunities that you have to influence, and then think about where you can make that influence, where you can be an ally with utilizing that power. Off you go. Um, same for you guys, obviously on live stream. Jotting things down. One last thing that I'm going to ask of you guys then, I'm going to flick through some of these slides to this. It's all very well just saying things, right? But we talk about doing, we've got to do. And without, you know, where would we be without making a commitment? That's actually where I feel like I make most of my actions. If I say I'm going to do something, I know that I'm not really going to do it unless I tell somebody else. That's what I normally do. I either go and post it on social media and then I'm like, oh, I have to do it now. Or tell somebody and then they're always like, oh, well, how's that thing coming along? And you're like, God, I remember I committed to that, didn't I? So, oh, and I write it down. Now, if I read books in the front page of a book, I will write the exact date that I'm going to finish it by because I'm so bad at finishing books. So I've decided this is now how I make my commitments and it's actually really helps me drive action. So the very, very last thing I'm going to ask for you guys to do is make a commitment. Today we've talked about all the different things. There's an opportunity in your organization that you've defined. You've then gone on to actually think about like how you can bring people along with you on that journey. Maybe you need to hire somebody, maybe you need creating a role, maybe you just need to have a conversation. Then you've thought about actually how you can tell authentic stories because that's going to help people resonate and bring them along with you on that journey. And then lastly, of course, that action, so where you can utilize those points of power that you have uh, and really lean into those and being an ally. And last but not least then, say tomorrow, who are you gonna be? What are you gonna do differently that you didn't do today? And what is that commitment gonna be towards this project? So 
have a little think, share one another, and that's the very last thing that I'm going to ask you to do. You've got very quick, 30 seconds each. Go, go, go. Made a commitment. Commitment? Made, made a commitment? What's your commitment? Can I ask what your commitment is? Help your team grow their revenue. Okay, great. Did you guys do a commitment? Love that. Yes. Love that. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, go on. Mmm. True. <laughs> there you go. That is very true. Asking questions is really important because obviously you're just going to assume, aren't you, if you don't know. You can be faffing around on a computer for half an hour trying to work out how to do something. Whereas if you just ask the person next to you how to do it, it's done in five seconds flat. True. That's true. Yeah. There's also an added benefit, isn't there? What about you guys at the back? Did you... Commitments? Yeah, we have a few that we've, well, we've got quite a list. Wow. Us, but I think um, <laughs> first and foremost, and really easy commitments that we can do is just our job descriptions. We haven't actually got any blurb about equal opportunities um, yeah. for applications and also application questions so we can understand where the backgrounds of people that are applying to our roles. And the other thing, what was the other thing I mentioned? I think also no names on CVs. Mm. So maybe that would... Um, yeah, taking names off so to avoid any unconscious bias so or true. any biases in general, actually. Yeah. Um, so those are really quick things that we can commit to. I could do that tomorrow. <laughs> um, but then there's other big ones that we have, which I think are going to take a little bit longer to uh, to work out. I so, love that. You've yeah. really gone deep and thought about it. And yeah, the wording <laughs> is so important, isn't yes, it? Right? Yeah. And you guys really thought about that end-to-end -end process. Mm. I can feel for it. Sure. So amazing. Thank you for yes. sharing. Anybody else to share? Are you good? Commitments? We're good, we're all gonna wrap up. So just to reiterate what we've gone through, start to start, as I said, we've got to start from the start. We thought about what D and I, D, E and I is and how we can do things differently. We then talked about empathy and obviously how we can really start at the beginning, create from an inclusive lens. Then we talked about authenticity, sharing our stories. That's how we're going to bring people on the journey with us is by opening up ourselves, leading by example, being vulnerable and telling those stories. Getting feedback along the way is super important, however we can, even if that's just asking somebody in your organization or better still, if you can put out a survey, then it's about nipping and tweaking, right? That post-production stage to make sure that we're still on the right track. And then last but not least, is making sure we've got it accessible to all. So every time that we are executing, it's thinking about have we got the right wording? Are we being bringing, you know, making sure that everybody can actually get involved here? Because it's all fundamentally about those set success metrics, which were creating community, making sure we feel belonged, like feel we like we belong, um, and all of those lovely things. So thank you guys so much brings us to the end. If you have any questions or want to follow up with me or if you want any feedback from me as well or anything, you are more than welcome to reach out to me. Thank you so much. Thank you guys and having back to Reese.